I've been asked to talk to you about the background to the Garden of Memory, because in the years in which we've been making the Garden of Memory, I think sometimes the background has been lost. So I'd like to remind you of a day 22 years ago, the 5th of June 2000. We were here in a muddy field, and we posed the first stone of this Garden of Memory. It was a muddy field, a rainy day, the road didn't even exist at, at that time. Since then, we've built it collectively. When I say collectively, I mean with the authorities, different institutions who've changed names since the beginning, with the civil society, with the organizations who represent uh, particularly the survivors. And of course, I've, we built it with the constant moral and financial support of the Office of the First Lady and Imbuto Foundation. I'd like to underline this, because 22 years ago, we were here together, Madam Kagami, to pose this first stone, and I'm so pleased we're still together for this inauguration. However, this is just the very recent history of the Garden of Memory, the technical part of it. It has no importance whatsoever in relation to what the Garden of Memory represents, really. The background, the real background to the Garden of Memory is this. I visited Rwanda for the first time in August 1994. That time it was as a photographer. I'd been mandated by a certain number of civil society organizations in France, and particularly coordinated by the Community Rwandais de France, the Rwandan community in France, to make a photo reportage of what life was like after the genocide. To put into context, what was happening in Europe, in the West at that time, was we were getting a lot of images of the so-called aftermath of the genocide. These images, however, weren't taken in Rwanda. These images were coming from Congo, Tanzania, and other places outside Rwanda, and were basically of the families who escaped with the killers uh, outside of the frontiers of Congo. Uh, of Rwanda. That is why we found it so important to document what was happening inside Rwanda at that time. Because basically what we saw in the images coming out of Rwanda were that the victims were absent from the picture. What was actually happening was history was being rewritten uh, at the, in direct on the television in the newspapers in Europe. However, I'm a visual artist more than a photographer. In the two or three years which followed this first visit, I started to ask myself what role could art play in a memorial process? What role art could play in imposing an act of memory? The challenge was immense at that time because there seemed so many other priorities. However, there was one thing which motivated me and that was the thought that art symbolically gave back humanity to people. And that is what had been confiscated during the uh, genocide. Humanity had been taken away from people and we had to, of course, rebuild physically, psychologically, the, the country, the individual, but we also had to rebuild symbolic foundations for the individual. So the challenge that was presented to me was what artistic form could this take? What work of art could be at the level of what a genocide was? To propose a sculpture or painting in a public place would be derisory. It's got no significance whatsoever confronted with what the victims had lived through. The first, uh, let's say, rule I imposed on myself when conceiving the Garden of Memory was that it had to be built collectively of course, with the authorities, as I mentioned, with the institutions, but more particularly with the survivors themselves. The idea, the original idea of this garden was to give a role to each and every survivor or every friend of survivor, every friend of a victim, to come and place a stone in memory of somebody who had been eliminated in their, uh, in their family or close to them. The idea was that it would be an ongoing process over years. The idea would be that each person individually could place, could do an act of memory in a ritual form 
which would maybe, hopefully, begin a first act of mourning, a first in the process of mourning. It was to be a cathartic ritual opening, the beginning of the mourning process, as I said. Well, stone represents the permanence of memory, its resilience. Stone is for eternity. My role in this first project of the Garden of Memory was merely as an artistic advisor to create something beautiful out of what the other people were creating. Over the years, of course, the conception has changed. Well, was talking with the partners, we found it necessary to introduce other aspects into the garden. A million stones, of course, it would have been beautiful, beautiful a million stones and hard to realize on a practical scale. So that is why we've introduced into this garden different aspects which remind people of the suffering, which remind people of the resilience and resistance of the uh, uh, victims of the genocide. Others before me have spoken uh, of the significance of the, uh, uh, the garden, the green part of this garden. I'd just like to bring your attention before finishing to one aspect which was important to me, which is the upright men feature, which you see behind us over there. The origin of this part of the garden dates back to two or three years before the 20th commemoration in 2014 of the uh, genocide. I was approached by the regretted uh, Jean de Dieu Mucho, uh, who's passed away, unfortunately, and hasn't seen the fruit of this work. And he said to me, in about 2012, he said, I know you're a painter. Can you find some sort of image which will represent Rwanda survivors 20 years after the uh, genocide. Again, it was a, a challenge for me because, as I said, no image can represent what happened here. No image, no sculpture is at the level of what it takes. However, as I, I decided to take up the challenge, and taking up the challenge, the thought was, well, what is Rwanda 20 years after the genocide? What does it look like? What do, how are the individuals, how are the communities living? How are they doing? And what I saw was a country standing upright. I saw individuals standing upright. The country had been reborn to a certain extent, of course, on the ashes of the victims, but the genocidal process hadn't uh, worked simply books genocide by definition is to confiscate humanity from the individual. And I saw a country where the human was alive and upright and standing there and able to uh, continue to make the country grow. So the upright men feature was to merely represent the dignity of the people of the country, of the uh, communities in the country. It's a work of art can't explain the whole genocide. It can just be a symbol of something. And this symbol is the uprightness, uh, the dignity of a people who came through hell. To conserve history, to tell the real story, we need historians, of course, researchers, testimonials. To render dignity to the victims, we need justice, truth, material reparations, psychological and medical support. And we need art. So I'd like to just finish with one uh, comment on art. First of all, it might have surprised you that we're here to inaugurate a garden, and I've been talking about art all this time as an artist. However, my definition of, of a work of art is anything that gives beauty and provokes thought, which isn't passive, which takes sides, which reinforces our com common humanity, and which poses acts of memory. Thank you.